Welcome back to Inclusive Design 24 2020, brought to you in partnership with uh, Barclays Access, Adobe, Intopia, Tetralogical, Infoaxia, Intuit, and WebAble. You can follow us on Twitter at ID24Conf, and if you have questions for the presenter, tweet them using the ID24 hashtag for our QA at the end of the session. A reminder that ID24 is a respectful community and you can find our code of conduct on the inclusivedesign24.org event site. Now I would like to introduce our next speaker who you may recognize if you joined for our previous session. It's Gareth Ford Williams, who will be telling Hi. us the wonderful thing about Tiggers. So over to you, Gareth. Thank you. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, um, <laughs> just about recovering from the last talk and I'm, 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 uh, I'm pushing on with this one. Um, yeah, so uh, wonderful thing about Tiggers. Um, this is a, a talk I gave originally, or it's based on a talk I gave originally at CSUN uh, back in uh, 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 2019, um, which was uh, improvised, um, which because it's about ADHD. Um, so this is going to be kind of a bit interesting. Um, I've got my, my obviously my, my opening slide here, which is my BBC Pass. Um, uh, my, my daughter put the picture of Tigger on it for me, which was great. And uh, thank you, Molly. And, um, uh, and I completely forgot to add any notes uh, against this slide. <laughs> so I'm just going to move to the next one, which is a very ADHD thing to do. So it's kind of going in the right direction. So uh, my name is Gareth Williams. Um, I'm dyslexic um, and uh, I, I always have been. Um, dyslexia is not something you grow out of. Dyslexia is a neurological condition uh, that affects the audio center of the brain. Um, and, uh, you know, I am also um, ADHD. -er. Now, I've got a real issue with, but with, with, with the, the phrase, the term ADHD. Um, you can be dyspraxic, dyslexic, autistic, but if you've got ADHD, you don't have a person-centered title. You've got nothing that owns it. You can't, I'm not a, or I'm not, you know, it's, and, it, and, and ADHD like dyslexia and like all these other things are a way that you are as a person. Um, it's part of your makeup. It's not a disease or something you catch or anything like that. It's just something that is associated with a bunch of traits and a bunch of, you know, sort of intrinsic parts of the, of the human you are so I've kind of decided to propose that I'm a Tigger because we've all kind of uh, hopefully everyone knows uh, Winnie the Pooh and um, and 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 Winnie the Pooh is quite interesting because you've got so many different neurological types with the the 10 main characters um, the 10 characters that you meet um, within within uh, within Winnie, within um, 100 acre wood uh, but Tigger really 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 does strike a chord with me um, there's a, a song and I'm going to read it out. I'm not going to sing it. Um, it says the wonderful thing about Tiggers is Tiggers are wonderful things. Their tops are made out of rubber. Um, their bottoms are mad, made out of springs. I kind of take slight, um, you know, <laughs> I take slight offense to that, but I do move. I'm as a kid, I was constantly moving. I couldn't sit still. Uh, bouncy, trouncy, flouncy, pouncy, uh, fun, 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 um, discuss. Uh, the most wonderful thing about Tiggers is that I'm the only one. Now, that, this last statement, I suppose in a, in a, in a hundred acre wood, um, when you have only, you know, sort of 10 people in society, um, then uh, actually statistically, that's probably about right. Um, but it isn't true. Um, there are loads of us. Um, and uh, by the way, don't go any further with the rest of the song because it becomes inappropriate. And if you behaved like that, you'd probably land up in court and on a list. So, as I said, this is kind of this is actually version three of this talk. Um, when uh, ID24 invited me to to uh, present, I thought, brilliant! I've already I've got it. I can just pull all that stuff together. And and then I realised actually, you know, improv needs an audience. Otherwise, you have no idea which way to go because it's all about. And and I know you're out there. Um, and uh, but obviously, you know it's difficult interacting in a situation like this. So I had a bit of a rethink of it. Um, I was gonna do another one for Funker and because it was no longer improv because it was based on a previous thing, I made even more interaction. So I had to strip all that out. So it's been, it's been a, a kind of an, a, an interesting process is trying to um, portray stuff without using its nature within the, the, the actual uh, format that you're delivering in it. So please bear with me. Um, warnings. 
Um, you know, this is sort of structured, uh, is warning number one. Um, the slides are probably more use uh, to me than they are to you. Um, so what I usually do is with all slides that I create, it's usually as a reminder to me of what the heck I should be talking about at this moment. Um, I have an appalling short term memory. This this is why you know I can write slides, I can I can rehearse them, and uh, and the following day I'm really not quite sure what's in the deck. Um, so I might forget what point was that I plan to make it, um, and what the point is that I'm trying to make. Um, I, there might be quite a few tangents. I might get a little bit lost. Uh, I may forget words. Uh, lost words lead uh, for me to anxiety, which results in more lost words and thoughts and so on. Uh, so the wheels could come off at any moment. Um, so let's see where we go. Um, as I was saying, you know, ADHD, like dyslexia or autism or any other neurological condition, these are lifelong conditions. You know, my brain decided to develop in a particular way. Um, I don't consider it broken in any way. Um, it has been rather, um, particular, uh, you know, when it came to the development of, of its own frontal lobes and basal ganglia. Um, I am a little bit more, you know, obviously um, more impulsive, a little bit more anxious. I seem to have a multi-track narrative with all the tracks playing different songs at once in my head. Um, I also have, uh, you know, sort of dyslexia, which adds a certain extra bit to the audio side of my brain in processing. Um, and so, you know, it, it can be quite interesting, particularly when I, when when it comes down to communication. Um, it, you you're constantly kind of battling with the um, the words that you do have uh, rather than the words that you want. So, a little bit of a dive into so how many people have got um, ADHD? Now there are various different statistics out there, and I don't trust really any of them. Um, you know, the screening hasn't been around for very long. Um, it's still not brilliant um, a lot of it has to be kind of pushed from the family side of stuff it's not done automatically um, there are figures of around about five percent of children but considering screening particularly around most neurological conditions is incredibly bad for for young girls because they're all of the screening um, frameworks are based around the way that the conditions present themselves for young males um, so we don't know um, and more and more and more people are, are kind of coming to this later on in life and going, hang on a minute and, and dis, you know, and doing a bit of exploration there. So I think those figures are going to evolve over time and it's, it's going to be an interesting thing to, to track. Um, there's always the, the discussion that happens around, you know, people say, well, they'll grow out of it, you know, and all the rest of it, you, you don't grow out of the way you are. You know, I, I couldn't grow out of being, you know, sort of, you can't, you know, well, you do grow out your hair color because it turns gray um, or mine, in my case, it just falls out. Um, but, you know, it's it's the way you are is the way you are for life. Um, it, people have uh, developed coping strategies. They mask. And and so saying that you can't see the symptom anymore doesn't un, doesn't mean there's still no underlying condition. It just means that people have got better at at dealing with it and behaving in a way that society wants them to behave rather than a way that is natural to them. It was interesting. I don't know whether it 30% is, is, is how accurate that is. I mean, there are, are a couple of interesting reports done by, I know it was Cheltenham prison and there was another prison as well that went and did, a, a, you know, looked at learning and uh, uh, um, uh, what they called learning disabilities. Um, and they looked at all sorts of different conditions uh, neurological conditions, cognitive conditions in prison populations, and over half the prison population had a condition. Um, and yet, when you look at, you know, mainstream society, you know, usually you're looking at somewhere around about 10%. And I met a couple of prison officers at a, um, uh, a couple of people actually from the prison service and had, had dinner with them at, actually at, a, at an ADHD conference a couple of years ago, and uh, which was a wonderful thing, uh, ADHD Foundation, one one. And um, and they were saying, oh, I asked them about this figure and they just said, and the rest, um, you know, and so there's there's a it's a, it's an interesting and why do people end up opting out of society and dropping out of society is, you know, a whole area, you know, it needs explaining. Uh, and, and actually at the same uh, place, I, I, there was a lot of people, medical professions there, and, uh, and someone told me that they reckon that it was roughly about 40% um, uh, more of a chance of dying before the age of 40, particularly around ADHD. 
And I thought, well, that's crack. Is that that to do with, you know, obviously because of, you know, some mental health conditions and related conditions around that. And they said, no, you know, it's, it's a mixture of stuff. It can also be falling out of trees. Um, so back to a little bit me. So hyperactive is what I was called. I was born in 1969. ADHD didn't really exist as a thing, as a, as a, as a, as a label in those days. So I was just told, parents told I was a hyperactive child. Um, I was, I'm always, I'm still compulsive. I can control my compulsions a lot more than I, I used to. Hugely distracted, which I got during the last uh, presentation when I heard a noise and forgot to move the slide on, Charlie prompted me because uh, I forgot that I was driving. Um, and that happens, uh, very reactive, which goes with compulsive, uh, but it's that's more compulsive is more something that is driven, reactive is more, you know, I, I will respond back to stimuli uh, incredibly quickly without any filter um, at some times. And, uh, and that is one of those things that takes an enormous amount of energy to control. Um, huge short-term memory loss is constant thing. I, I, I'm, you know, people say as you get older, you walk into rooms and have no idea why you're there. And that's for me, that's been the last 50 years. Um, little choice of focus. Now it's not that I'm an unfocused person. I'm massively focused at some things and get really, really into some things. Uh, I don't necessarily choose what those things are. Um, uh, social cues probably spelt wrong. Um, <laughs> just realize that's the wrong sort of cues. Um, no, it, 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 I don't pick up on a lot of the, the subtleties um, around stuff. Um, talk for England, which is why I'm here on my own, chatting away to what could be static. Um, and, uh, and, and I will carry on doing that. Uh, the the hyper-focus comes in at times where I can become so focused in on stuff, everything else just disappears. And I will, you know, suddenly realize hours later, I'm still doing it because I've got so in everything just suddenly launches into one. Can't necessarily choose what that is. And they just happened totally unstructured like this talk. Um, sometimes massively obsessive. I'll come to that a little bit later. Uh, very emotional. Um, and I hear this a lot from other people who, who, who have the condition and it, it's... Um, you know, you're, you're, um, it's, it's a difficult thing to sometimes control and you become massively, you know, some, a lot of people, not necessarily myself in all situations, but you become hugely emotionally in, uh, invested in things very, very easily and, uh, and short-term memory loss. Um, of, oops. Uh, so, um, you know, it's one of, of, of many different uh, types of uh, neurological and cognitive conditions. I've got on here, I've got ADHD, depression, dyslexia, dyspraxia, uh, sorry, um, anxiety, uh, DCD, which is development coordination disorder, which is dyspraxia, uh, autistic spectrum disorder, and SLCN, uh, which is speech, language, and communication disorder, or sometimes called aphasia. Um, the thing is, all of this has traits. It's all related. It's all the brain and, and everyone is slightly different. And we have I personally, I've got this thing that I, I actually believe everyone's got a mixture of traits anyway. You know, we just if you just end up with a certain collection of them, you end up with a label. Um, and, uh, you know, and everyone there's there's an elasticity around this that we're, we're yet to tease out. Um, and I find this the, the relationship side of stuff, because if you meet anyone who's got one condition, you usually find out they've got more, but that's because they've gone through a process to discover that. Um, and then, you know, you find other people who've never been through a process and never asked those questions, don't realize the traits they've got. So a disclaimer, uh, the next bit of this is mostly anecdotal and there is very little science behind any of it, any of the following whatsoever. Um, this is the little bit about me, um, me, 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 me. Um, I thought I was going to I was going to split this talk into a couple of bits. I'm, I'm going to more explore my kind of uh, my experience of the condition, and then uh, and then I'm going to talk about barriers uh, a little bit, uh, just lightly, and I'll come to some of this a little bit later. Um, but you know, sometimes we all we all have our own experiences. You know, I don't speak for all people with ADHD. I never speak for all people with you know dyslexia or anyone with a condition you know as such you can only ever express your own your own opinions around this this is why this is always interesting around user research is that you need enough user research for it to be statistically significant because one opinion is one opinion of a barrier and then you might find out that's the only person that has that barrier because of a certain set of complexities around it 
So I think it was said before, I, I, I actually met someone um, a, um, a while back um, who had, uh, who has also has uh, ADHD, who said something rather wonderful to me, and I can't for the life of me remember her name now, but she said, um, you know, for her, um, the way she tries to explain it to people is, and uh, this isn't a picture of televisions, this is just a picture of lots of little statements uh, on brightly colored cards on a wall. And for her, she said, it's like having a, a wall of televisions, um, all on different channels, all with the sound turned up, and you're trying to watch all of them at the same time. Someone else has got the remote control and keeps randomly changing the channels. And, and, and that for her is permanent and there's no respite from it. It's this constant barrier um, and this is that hard thing. You have so many parallel thoughts. You're constantly pulling apart and, and opening up ideas. And most of them are just pointless, you know, and then you're, you're trying to filter through all of this stuff and you're constantly filtering your own. Um, and I, I, I love this image because some of the stuff that's on there is just, you know, it, it just summed up, um, you know, a little bit. It's just words like too much information. Uh, 97 is the new 100 IQ and I'm afraid of bubbles. Uh, I'm not actually afraid of bubbles. I just love that statement, but there are multiple ones on this. And that's how desperate these, these kind of thoughts can be. I find myself with them. Sometimes I try and capture them. I like writing on my arms. Um, uh, if I write on pieces of paper, uh, I lose pieces of paper and hopefully I'm not gonna lose my arm. Um, so it's a fairly permanent place to write. But the problem is, um, uh, I sometimes forget and I don't put enough information on my arm. I've got this wonderful one. I actually took a photograph of it. Sometimes I'll write on my arm and just think in case that gets rubbed off, I'll then photograph it. So then I've got a photo record of the thing that's on my arm and it's in two places. Um, I think it's, you know, the, the, the old saying with this software, if it's not backed up three times in three different places, it doesn't exist. Um, and so I try and do this and back it up. And, and this one just says reverse engineer dark patterns. I still, they, I think I wrote that on my arm about two years ago and I still can't remember what on earth I was thinking at the time and why on earth I would even want to do that. Um, but there was obviously something going on in my head that day that I thought was important enough that one day I might remember it and this may trigger that memory. Um, so you have these coping strategies continuously. Um, the next slide, it's, it's actually a, a, um, a, 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 someone who's re-photoshopped a, 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 an old ladybird book uh, and it, it says, um, uh, I've got ADHD and underneath it, it's a subtitle, it says, or am I just a little bastard? Um, it, it, one of the things people mix up is ADHD is not a behavioral condition. Um, you may get overly excited as a child, you may, because you're dealing with your in, all, all of this input and you're responding to the input, whereas other people can switch off the input and you can't. I met this wonderful guy, um, Finton, ah, I should have written his name down on my arm. Um, he's a, a wonderful speaker. He's actually a headmaster of a school uh, down south somewhere and, and I need to go and have a chat with him at some point. And uh, I saw him uh, speak once about it and he said, you know, when you've got uh, children in your class and one of them's got ADHD, you guaranteed if, if a cat wanders into the playground, that's the kid that will spot it and shout out, there's a cat in the playground. And then suddenly all the kids want to see the cat in the playground because there's a cat in the playground. There shouldn't be a cat in the playground. There wasn't a cat before. And he said, the one thing he learned was never to fight it. And it's like, let's all go to the window and have a look at the cat. And then we can all settle down and do our job. If we try and overly control that child, they become even more frustrated and, and more anxious and you know it's not their fault it's just they were really excited to see a cat in a playground and they wouldn't whisper to the person something or itself it just blurts out and and people mistake this for actually bad behavior and it's not it's 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 responsive behavior um this is kind of um this, this is kind of plays out in all my school reports uh i, I always find them uh, very very amusing um, because they all started with Gareth is a nice boy, but uh, I actually kept one of them. I, I was trying to find it the other day. I, I thought it would make a really good slide um, because literally just those kind of words and then the list of stuff that I've done. And uh, this image is me uh, sitting on, oh, it's probably in the late 1970s, got a bowl head haircut, a, a duffel coat and flares. And uh, so I'm on top of a, a brick wall. So, you know, that's it. I used to climb everything. If there was a hole, I'd climb in it and get stuck. I got rescued a lot. Um, 
and uh you know and and it's those kind of things as an experience that's where you were i mean the weird thing is you know you, you know at school i got put uh, as, a, as a young school this is in the early 1970s on a table even though it's a very progressive school that i went to it was a brilliant school um but this was the 1970s and so they had a table called the thick table uh where all the kids that had difficulty sat and it wasn't nicknamed by the kids the the, the teachers called it the thick table and um you know or you're in remedial you know it was one of those <laughs> however insulting it might be but uh, and those were those kind of things and that kind of stuff sticks with you uh, as a kid and um uh, the next slide is uh, actually a picture of me. It was at CSUN a few years ago where I managed to sit at the desk for the Central Intelligence Agency. And I always thought it was very funny with me uh, underneath the word intelligence. Um, and um, it, it that sort of stuff sticks with you. And even if you turn around and go, yeah, I know that was the past and that was someone's opinion. Um, what you're told as a child sticks with you for life. You know, if you are, you are told you're a bad person when you're age five, it's really hard to shake. And it's programmed into you, uh, and it, it's a, it's a really difficult thing to work your way out. Which is where, again, a heck of a lot of anxiety. Which is why, you know, negative, uh, positive reinforcement is really, you know, and Finton's way of managing that child and not, you know, uh, chastising them for, for 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 them not being able to cope with their own sensory input. Um, it's the best way of doing it because then they don't consider themselves as broken, and they learn to cope, and they learn to deal, um, and they come out as a much, you know, sort of happier human being. Um, one of the things about that school I absolutely loved is um, this is, by the way, this is a, a slide of the cast of The King and I uh, from the West End. And um, now we, we had it was it was a school that took on a lot of very, very difficult children in South Manchester and a wonderful, wonderful headmaster called Mr. Nixon constantly smoking a cigar. This is the 70s. Uh, and uh, and uh, it, but he believed that one of the most important lessons that we could do during the week and all the kids would do is learn show tunes and musical tunes. And we used to learn. And uh, and one of them was um, this wonderful tune called A Whistle, A Happy Tune. And I must have been about five or six years old when I learned this. And I'm going to read out the, the words which really stuck with me. And it's whenever I feel afraid, I hold my head erect and whistle a happy tune so no one will suspect I'm afraid. When shivering in my shoes, I strike a careless pose and whistle a happy tune and no one ever knows I'm afraid. The result of this deception is very strange to tell for when I fool the people I fear, I fool myself as well. And I didn't realize at the time I took a lot. These words really struck home with me as even as a very young child, particularly that last, that last line. And, I, and it actually taught me how to mask. And so, you know, one of those things that you're constantly dealing with, if, you, if you've got a, a condition and you're dealing with anxiety and depression, is if you don't show it externally, then people behave in a very, you know, they don't, they don't respond to you. And if, they, if the people respond against that, they can sometimes reinforce it because they're reminding of you of where your head is at. And it becomes a bit cyclical and people are really well-meaning and lovely and want to support you. And I found that if I was continuously going, yay, um, then people go, he's all right, yay. And then you started to forget that you weren't yay. Um, and, uh, and it does help. It, it's, uh, it's probably placebic in, in its way as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, a response, but it was very, very, very effective. Another thing from when I was a kid is my dad, actually, he ran a, um, I always find it very, very privileged that my, my younger, younger years, I was brought up um, on a flat and then a small house on the grounds of a residential school for for um, disabled children and these were the kids that other disabled uh, other special needs schools uh, usually couldn't cope with um, because they had very 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 involved conditions or behavioral things or communication difficulties and aphasia and and it was well known actually as a school for most a lot of aphasic kids there and uh, and they were my friends because it was residential they were all my friends I was played with after school you know I come back from from school um, but one of my dad's friends happened to be a child psychologist uh, called Lorette Lee, and he was also the Chinese community leader in Manchester, and he babysat me quite a few times. And, uh, and one of the things he would do is to help me concentrate is give me a couple of bowls and a pile of buttons or beads and a pair of chopsticks. And I had to move all of the buttons from one bowl to the other using the chopsticks and I had to concentrate very hard it taught me to use chopsticks. But it also meant I got a chocolate bar at the end of it and I wanted that chocolate bar and it helped me focus. I mean, he also got me to roll all his cigarettes for me, um, uh, which my dad wasn't particularly amused by uh, at the time. I don't think he was quite as supportive around that. But, you know, I could make lots and lots and lots of little cigarettes. And 
this is the 1970s. I always got to remind myself of it. But I always felt the bowls, the chopsticks, etc., was a really, really useful thing to do. Uh, my mum also had a wonderful, um, she was an embroiderer. Um, and um, she, uh, at times um, uh, later on, when I was about seven or eight years old, uh, we fell on kind of quite hard times. We didn't have much money. And um, she bought industrial mop heads, uh, which were all made out of masses of different types of threads. And uh, she used to give them to me and I used to spend literally hours unpicking these things and then lining all of the threads up by color and by type and then re-rolling them. And she used to make all of her, lots of her stuff out of the stuff that I drew out of what was waste. And, uh, and this is just a picture of one of the things that she did. She passed a couple of years ago. Um, but this is made out of the threads um, that I recovered um, and so, you know, I still got this and it's kind of a reminder again of another exercise, another thing. I, I still love knots. Give me, I, I can't watch cables. I can't see cables in a mess. I have to unknot and straighten cables out. It's a kind of, it's, I think it's all come down to that. But then I grow up, I've had no plans. I'm 51. I still don't want to know. I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. No qualifications. I became a sound engineer because that's all I wanted to do. And they didn't teach it at school. So I wasn't really bothered. Um, I then ended up deciding that I did need to get an education and got everything I needed to do and ended up doing a fine art degree. Uh, I've worked as a life model, a machine operator, a cleaner, a seller manager, a letting agent, artist studio manager, business uh, development manager, artists, and I store images. And I go, yeah, that kind of that kind of sums it up. And I love that. And it's a, a lovely little image of a chap with a wheel, like on a game show, he's going to spin it. And it says, waking up and wondering how your day is going to go. And it says, let's give this sucker a spin and every single thing it could land on is shit. And, you know, even though you look at it, I love it because that's sometimes, you know, you just sit there and you just kind of, you've got to get past this. And it's just like, let's give it a spin. And, and, and what, what kind of shit are we going to deal with today? And then we kind of build on with that. Uh, I love this one as well. Someone put up, which was I, I've started coloring uh, to manage my stress and anxiety. And it's a little coloring template of a, 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 a lovely kind of like rose as in geometric pattern uh, circle. And they've just scribbled all over it really, really, really violently. Um, and, you know, and that is for me, it just is as a, as a metaphor deals with so much stuff. And you have these structures and, and when you're massively anxious, it, it, you just completely they, 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 they do not help uh, and you end up reacting against them. And with all of that comes, uh, you know, um, uh, imposter syndrome. Um, I actually forgot what those words were, and I, I luckily wrote them down uh, <laughs> for myself because I knew I was going to forget imposter syndrome. Uh, by the way, this is just a dog uh, pretending to be a chemist with I have no idea what I'm doing written next to him. Um, and uh, I'm sorry if you can keep hearing it. There's a car outside uh, my window who keeps beeping his horn. That's not me. Um, and uh, so I've not become a clown in the meantime, but you are constantly dealing with all of this and you're constantly turning around to yourself and saying, no, 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 that is, that is not real. That's just chemicals and conditioning and you have to think past it and it's a struggle. I stim as in not in kind of the traditional way, but I love fid, uh, fidget cubes, which I, I lost my fidget cube for lockdown. Um, and uh, but I have lots of other objects. I've got a picture here of the one that I'm actually using at the minute. I'm, I'm stimming with um, as, a, as a fidget thing. Uh, by the way, loads of people stim. Anyone plays with a pen or you know in meetings, you know you sit there and sometimes they're bouncing their leg or they're tapping the desk. That's stimming. You know it's a very very popular thing and a very common thing. People don't realise they're doing it. And it's a way of getting rid of nervous energy or you know it's it's a, it's an outlet. I think they're great. I think it's wonderful. I think everyone should, should just let, let go and, and move the way that they want. Um, but it's a beautiful little pebble. It looks like a Barbara Hepworth sculpture in mi miniatures. So it's kind of like a jelly bean shape with a naturally occurring hole. One of my weird things is I love stones with naturally occurring holes in them. Um, and, uh, and I do have a tendency of picking them up and, and shoving them in pockets. And, and it's also broken bits of china with typography on them. I like those or old patterns. Um, really useful stuff to collect. Um, and uh, oh, and I've got another one that I really like. Now, this one is actually, I can probably share it with you if you can't see it. Um, so uh, like Seven Spoon uh, gave this uh, to me when uh, she gave this to me when I was over in the States quite recently, you might be able to hear a clacking noise. And it's the most wonderful kind of like little 
dice puzzle thing made out of metal and it, it's, it's articulated in loads of different ways and you can move it and I can sit there for ages. Now I'm not going to use this because it's really loud, it's really heavy and it's really annoying for everyone else. So I'll stick with the pebble for now. But these things are really, really important and they help you focus and they help give you an outlet when you, you, you're not moving and, uh, you know, and you, you, you're feeling that kind of nervous energy. I rarely finish anything. Um, this, this slide, that's all it says. Um, uh, the amount of started projects, the amount of things that I constantly go, I'm going to have a go at that. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the woodshed that's still in flat pack form after two years in the back garden. Um, you know, the, the, there are so many uh, things that I've got part way through. Sometimes, I, you know, it's, it's one of those I, I don't get the time because I'm still half doing a lot of other things. Um, but I find that is incredibly hard is, is, uh, is, is sort of seeing something through to the end without going off on a tangent and doing something else. Here's an example of it. Um, there are three pictures of three different Playmobil figures. I bought more. I just some, for some reason had one evening. I thought I'm going to buy every Playmobil figure that for some reason part something about it reminds me of my wife and therefore I can build a play a, a, a little Ginny, who's the name of my wife, and uh, she's. Uh, and I could build. I never got around to doing it. I've still got all the figures. I never ended up pulling them apart and building one. But each one had something about them, and I went right. I can use that part and build a little, build a build a Ginny. And uh, to me, it was just like then all these parcels start turning up, and she's like, "What have you bought?" It's like I've been busy on eBay, <laughs> um, and uh, it kind of escalated from there. And we ended up with masses of pirate. Playmobil and uh, and yeah and it, it kind of just go off in a tangent with that but it's kind of like a mini uh, version of it so how my brain works on this slide it's, it's a little switch and it says utterly obsessed or uninterested um, which is is it's just one of those things it's the way that things are and I've, I've always the great thing is you know you get obsessions and they can last your life they can last years uh, luckily accessibility is one of those things it becomes the obsessions become passions and you just go, you just never, never get bored and tired and just turn those into your life, turn them into the thing that you do and make money from them, you know, and you, you'll do good things. Uh, this one was uh, something actually a friend of mine sent, which just said um, it was a picture of uh, me. Well, it's my head cut out on a speedway driver who's, who's falling off his motorbike whilst holding a sausage butty. Um, and it just says warning, bikes and sausage butties don't mix. Uh, this is one of those things where I forget and I try and do multiple things at the same time because I'm trying to do one thing and then I start doing something else. And it probably harks back to the NHS statistics earlier, you know, climbing a tree and then deciding to dance is probably a good way of, you know, falling out of it um, because you've you, you lose that context of place and you start doing something else and then it reduces you know, the safety or focus that you have in that one thing. And therefore it kind of goes off on the rails and stuff. But I've always liked that image. And a friend of mine, Andy Badger, uh, sent me that. And uh, another one, uh, which is, uh, it, it's a great picture is Dutch painting. I think it's Dutch painting. Um, and uh, and it just says, it, it's a character. Um, and he's got, for some reason, he's holding a skull and he's sticking in the, the, his, his finger in the nose hole. And at the top, it says, uh, when the sign in the museum says, do not touch. And this is what I love that image because it, it sums up the compulsion. And as soon as someone suggested that it shouldn't do it, part of your brain goes, do it. <laughs> and it, you, you fight. Uh, and those compulsions can be really, really, you know, strange. You know, I have actually found myself staring at brick walls in the past. Uh, this one says, sorry, I'm late. I spent the last hour staring at a wall. Um, and these do happen. It was a good wall. You know, it was really interesting, really old brick, all sorts of bits and pieces all over it. And you find yourself kind of exploring it and becoming hyper focused. And it can happen not just on brick walls, but in all sorts of places. And then time disappears. And it's like, oh, God, I should have been in a meeting uh, three hours ago. Uh, and I, I've, I've been doing this instead. And, um, and it's the kind of the way that happens. And it's really, really hard not to do it. Uh, and uh, and um, uh, another image I absolutely love is a, a very badly put up shelf. Um, it was actually in a local art gallery and it's a chap who goes around art galleries and blindfolds himself and uses power tools to put shelves up. Um, and, uh, and, and they're always wonky and they're all brilliant, you know, and actually I looked at it and go, well, you know, to be quite frank, you know, unblindfolded, I wouldn't do a better job because I can't focus on things that I don't find interesting. And I certainly don't find DOI destroy it yourself. Uh, it, I don't find that interesting. Um, and this, this is that kind of thing is that, that sometimes when I'm not into something, that's the output. I subvert a lot as well. And subversion is always one of those things that's quite interesting. So there's a lovely thing of a horse here as a, as a, uh, 
a puzzle and someone instead of remaking the puzzle the jigsaw puzzle as the horse they've just rearranged the picture uh, the pieces so it kind of re basically uh, creates a horse um and when i was a fine artist it was a kind of similar thing i just made loads of dots on pieces of glass because the glass um was partly reflective and it, it broke up the reflection and the reflection broke up the picture and the dots broke up the picture and and it i was constantly constantly moving and i absolutely loved that there's an evolutionary um uh, uh, a theory by a guy called, I think it's Jonathan Williams, Williams, a, cl a clinical psychologist, that actually um, uh, ADHD is uh, an evolutionary advantage thing. Uh, here's a picture of a load of uh, a kind of uh, nomadic kind of cave people, Stone Age, Ice Age, probably Ice Age, actually, by looking at the picture. And they're saying, are lions friendly? It's the first time they've ever seen them, and they're off in the distance, the lion. And uh, so, and then someone says, where's Gareth? And, uh, and I'm over there with the lions um, being eaten. Um, because the thing is, I've while they're all discussing it, I've gone off to actually see it because I don't have a filter. And then they discover that lion's not friendly. Um, and uh, so no one else does it. And, and thinking about uh, ADHD as a li li the minesweeper of humanity actually means that we all stay safe because I find out that those berries are poisonous because I've already eaten them because they look nice. And uh, because I don't have that filter, I don't have that restriction around it. But And so all of this kind of comes through. You have this wonderful divergent th uh, uh, thinking. You create choices. And I love working with people who are convergent. And they take those things and they analyze them and they reconstruct them. And, and you find that works incredibly well. Um, uh, the, the, this slide is always a bit one that, that kind of is a, always a bit of a sad thing is that, you know, one of those things is for every action is Newton saying for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And always remember that when you know people with ADHD, if they're really, really, really bright, really sparky, really up there, really positive, um, there's always that underlying bit on it. And you can crash if you're constantly up there. You go the other way. You might hide it, but you go the other way. Uh, and I lost a friend a couple of years ago uh, who was like that. Everyone saw him as the ticker and no one understood. And one day he didn't bounce. Um, and, uh, you know, and it's one of those. We also part of the puzzle and no one saw the picture because he was such a great masker. Also, self-medicating takes a lot of people. Um, the interesting, when you start looking at, at, at statistics, the amount of uh, um, particularly amphetamine abuse and alcohol abuse uh, with people with ADHD trying to trying to just deal with the noise is enormous. Um, the weirdest thing is, if you actually are putting on medication, uh, they mostly give you amphetamines. So, <laughs> hey, but at least it's controlled. So, what does any of this do to do with accessibility? Uh, hopefully, what follows is a bit useful. So, I'm going to do a quick thing about convergent des uh, um, cognitive de design. Um, um, is a, which is about a, um, usability uh, from a neuroscientific perspective and cognitive accessibility, which is about barriers faced by people who are neurodivergent. And I'm going to bring them together a little bit in the next couple of things as quickly as I can. By the way, I'm going to put out a, a, an article at the um, after the end of ID24 party tonight. If you follow me on, which will go into this in a bit more detail. Um, and if you follow me on Twitter, you'll, 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 you'll get the link there. Uh, I'll pop that out. One of the things for me as a barrier is color. Um, this is just, this. your screen isn't broken, it's just red. Um, overwhelming, intense, bright reds, colors, that end of the spectrum, honestly, it's terrifying to me. They're just, they're just you know, the amount of all parents that you meet with ADHD children who said don't paint their bedrooms red because they don't sleep, they don't move, they don't, they just sit there, they're overwhelmed, they're overstimulated. And stimulation through colour can be massively problematic. And, you know, one of our buildings in the BBC is so red on the inside. I hate meetings there. Um, and uh, it's just exhausting. Um, uh, signifiers are really, really useful for us. Here we've got stop and go, and the stop is on a, a, a green square and the go is on a red. You know, usually those colours are the other way around. I need things to work the way they are. And I find there's a kind of cognitive fail for me when things seem to contradict each other as far as you know the affordance what may be and the instruction and they don't match up and i i find that they, i get really really lost i also need stuff that's very very literal here we've got a, 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 a an input field and and a label with name uh, written on it now that for me i mean for most people they just put their name in there because they'd expect that sometimes i really need it to say your name um, because I will start, I'll think, I may even start with my name and then go, well, is it my name or is it the name of something or is it someone else's name or is it just, you know, what, what is it asking for me? You know, if you want me to go and buy eggs, tell me how many and tell me what kind of eggs you want. I really need the literal because otherwise you will end up with all the eggs. 
you know, I, I will I'll be getting to such a state with it. I'll start making the wrong decisions because I'm not actually 100% sure I've interpreted the instruction correctly. And so, you know, literal instruction um, to deal with an anxiety response to something is really, really useful. Fourth one, uh, and there's only going to be one more after this before I finish. And the fourth one is two dots. And the right one is gently flashing away. I absolutely can't deal with flashing, flickering objects that sustain or, or you know, continuously cycle as far as animations or movement is concerned. You see a lot of this on uh, on TV platforms where they put up a menu and they put up a veil behind it rather than a flat color. And there's a moving image behind that. And I can't read the text because my brain's going image and uh, and I'm going on text and it's going image and I'm, I'm fighting to be able to continue. I mean, so I cannot not look at the flashing one. It's, it's really, really hard. And then for something of just looking, doing something that's a really simple task becomes problematic because, you know, like the red, it's what's in the field of vision is hitting me. It's not just the object that I'm focusing on, it's what I can see. There's an interesting thing around color as well around this. This is when, you know, when people put color type and different backgrounds and stuff. And there's been some research from Cambridge University around that uh, over the years, which is quite interesting. And they say it's not actually just about that. It's the entire field of color um, and the stimulation that's coming from that will actually impact the readability of the area of text you're talking about. Um, so the next one is actually I'm going to go all the way back to uh, 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 Kazimir Malevich, uh, who's a Russian avant-garde artist, art theorist from the early 20th century, um, obviously an art student. Um, I came across this when I was an art student. He was a huge influence on sort of modern non-objective and minimalist art. Um, and for me, this sums up Google and Yahoo. And uh, he, <laughs> or my experiences of them, he talked about, you know, if you want someone to look at a dot, if you want to put something on a painting and you want someone to look at it, don't put anything else on it. Just put the square, just put the dot, put the thing that you want them to focus on. Because as soon as you put two dots, your attention's halved and you're not quite sure which one's the most important one. And, and so suddenly it's all used as strange. And then you put more and more and more dots and you start to become less and less sure of what the hell you're supposed to be looking at. And here eventually I've got 25 dots. And so now I actually am, I'm now struggling to remember which was the first dot. And and everything seems to be you know of equal importance, and then suddenly it, it becomes of no importance, and and that's a real issue. And so the way this kind of moves on is that um, I actually watched it. It was a couple of years ago. I watched this wonderful YouTube um, talk. Um, it's, it's from uh, UX Live uh, 2018 by uh, Robert Humans from from UView, and he talked about the key principles of cognitive design. And in this talk, he he talked about uh, the a perceptual psychologist, Dr. Anne uh, Treisman, who studied human perception. And she was the one that kind of discovered the, the pop out effect as such, if you've come across it. And that's the, any search task is made easier if there is something unique about the target, something that will pop out of the display, the more unique the target uh, is, uh, the more it pops out. So if, if I wanted to know if, if you were, the thing that I wanted people to look at was the square, uh, the green square, um, you know, and here we've got back to the dots and some of them are, are now red squares and, and there's one green square. It takes you a little while to find it because some are squares and some are green, and, but it's the green square I want. And so, you know, but it's the only one. But then if you wanted to do it again and make it easier, then you make every single other object a, a different shape. They're all circles and there's only one square and it becomes more obvious where that square is because it's the only square rather than the red square is distracting you. And again, if you wanted to make it even easier, it then becomes the only green object in a sea of red. The it's now, it's now a, a green square in a series of red objects. And it is immediately obvious as where the focus could be. This kind of approach of cognitive design gives results in cognitive accessibility. And thinking about that kind of thing is, I need that to be made that really, really easy to find it. Um, you know, I, one of the things I'd love to find is, is I'd, I'd love someone to do a study of people who are congenitally blind and have ADHD and how how that impacts their screen reader experience. I think there's a there's a study in there somewhere because there will be we know as well there's as many dyslexic congenitally blind people as there are sighted because it's to do with the audio center of the brain. And so, you know, and I think it was Bath University or Bristol University have already done that study and, and already pulled out that, that data out. 
is to understand actually then you know screen reader experiences for congenitally blind ADHD people how does that expect when you you need that kind of how do I focus in in around you know semantic information and orders and and you know and hierarchies within within user experiences so uh you know we're pretty much at the end here now um and uh you know I'm just going to wrap up um one thing I would suggest is if, if you are interested in cognitive accessibility, particularly go check out the works that happening in the W3C COGA working group. Uh, I had the privilege of going along to one of their meetings once as a guest, along with Jamie Knight and Lion uh, and, uh, and Ollie. Um, and uh, we, we, we spent, it was, a, it was an amazing uh, workshop. The work they're doing is brilliant. It's early days. There's so much to look at. It's a massively complicated and uh, complex uh, subject area and huge growth area. But they're they're really doing some great work. It's a fantastic group, and uh, and please go and check it out. So, if you want to find out the stuff that I'm going to be posting, stay in touch. I'll be um, this. Uh, unfortunately, here's a picture of me asleep, but I will be wide awake um later on tonight following this right the way through to the end hopefully i'll be off for the next couple of hours so i won't be able to respond back because i've got work to do but then when i'm off work i'm going to be pushing on through to the end and please get in touch and i'll answer any of your questions so it's at gareth fw is my twitter handle um so thank you very much uh, thank you gareth that is not an unexpectedly fantastic talk um really fascinating um i think we don't have much time but we may be able to just fit in one question Sure. So we've had a question from Kathleen who asks, what has your experience been with performance reviews in the workplace with ADHD? Uh, she says she often feels a fight or flight response uh, and tends to dread them. And do you have any tips for dealing with them? Yeah, it sounds like job interviews and exams as well. Um, yeah, it's uh, I think I think one of those things is it's always it's a difficult thing it depends on your manager it depends on the, the environment that you work in and the relationship you have and you know you need to get the people around you to understand um and uh, and and to show that you know you 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 are working it's great you just sort of work in a kind of a, a slightly more less structured way than other things might work um but i think that's kind of if, if you are struggling, if you want to do your work, I'm, I'm going to talk as a manager here from a manager's perspective. So if you were for me, if you wanted to do your work and you have a, a you know, cognitive condition, which meant that that kind of structure and that kind of formality you're, fun, you, you're, you're struggling with, or there are things that are preventing you from doing your work and you want to do your work. It's my job as a manager to take those barriers away. If it's going wrong, it's the manager's failing, not the employee's failing. You know, that's the thing. If someone couldn't be asked and doesn't want to do their work, then that's 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 the employee. But I always put take every single member of my team and then you can't turn around and go, right, OK, we can't like the cat in the playground. We can't work against it. We need to acknowledge it. We need to work around and then everyone gets their work done. So that sounds like if you are in a situation, it's your manager is letting you down in, a, in that kind of thing. I may be reading too much into that, but I think that's always an important point to make. Does, is that okay <laughs> did that go off on a tangent i'm not sure as an answer <laughs> no no i think that was really a great answer okay well thank you so much gareth for not just one great session but two um and yeah we will see you later on i hope uh if you like this session and please hit the youtube like button and don't forget to subscribe to youtube.com slash inclusive design 24 to be kept in the loop on our future events Inclusive Design 24 is brought to you with thanks to Barclays Access, Adobe, Intopia, Tetralogical, Infoaxia, Intuit, WebAble, DQ Systems, and Adrian Roselli LLC. We will be back on the hour with our uh, next session, uh, which uh, is uh, Ariel Fox. Thank you very much. <laughs>